In July 4, Ukraine Media Center Ukraine 4 starts its operation and my name is Svetlana Shuparenko. Right now we will be having a presentation of the analytical report about the state of affairs in the state policy in economic sector. It was prepared by a number of Ukrainian entrepreneurs. Our guests today are Valery Pekar, lecturer at Kyiv Mahila Business School, Katerina Glaskova, executive director of the Union of Ukrainian Entrepreneurs, Andriy Dlihish, CEO of Advanta Group, and founder, co-founder of the Center of Economic Recovery, Gleb Bashlinsky, Executive Director of the Center for Economic Strategy, Olena Pavlenko, President at Dixie Group, Igor Borakovsky, PhD in Economics, Professor at the National University of Kyiv Mohila Academy, Head of the Institute of Political Consultations. So let's start our conversation about your analytical document. Ms. Katerina, I would like to to ask you the first, tell us about the Union of Ukrainian Entrepreneurs. How have you come up with the idea of preparing of this report and how did you decide to join this process to forecast of forecasting our future now that all the country starts talking about the way Ukrainian economy is gonna live after the war. Good afternoon, thank you very much. I would like to tell you about the Union of Ukrainian Entrepreneurs. It's the biggest union that of Ukrainian businesses. We exist for more than six years in Ukraine. We unite the businessmen from all the regions, in all sectors, of all sizes. The companies which today, now, during these most difficult times, continue creating jobs, paying taxes, are a proactive part of our society and in fact we cannot stand aside from those processes besides as an institution as a business association the union was always a platform that united the leading experts the leading specialists in different areas most prominent entrepreneurs we have a good dialogue with the government it's very important in the context that we will be talking about today about the recovery in Ukraine because we need to start talking now what Ukraine will look like after the victory because this is something that we will need to make happen after the victory. The project that we introduced today is very important and it's aimed at a wide audience, at a broad audience and we need to get the most people in possible engaged in this discussion. The discussion is already going on. We already represent the status of the project for the time being and we have engaged the most prominent analysts, economists of the country in this discussion in today's event and in other events of ours. And I want to thank all of the participants of this project for the high level of the discussion, for the high level of uh, issues being brought up and the result of this document should be a roadmap, a final document from the group of authors of Ukrainian entrepreneurs for the government, the way we see the recovery of Ukraine after the victory. That's a very, I would say, fundamental work. This is why we have so much speakers today here, because everybody works in their specific area. Actually, a lot of more people are involved in this process, more than there are speakers present today. I would like to thank our partners, USAID, for the support of this project, and Mr. Valery Pecker, for, as ideologist of this project, the person who pushes these projects to, to the masses. And I want to thank the other participants of the discussion. Thank you very much, Ms. Katrina. Mr. Valeri, as the ideologist of the project, please tell us about this project, about its place in the post-war recovery. What are the key problems? What are the key challenges that it describes? I would like to start with why it is important to talk about what will happen after the war today. There are four reasons. First of all, the war exhausts everybody. People lose vision, lose faith and only the joint vision of the future is something that unites people that reinforces them and secondly there are many people who left they need to be coming back or not be coming back and they will make this decision with based on their understanding what the post-war ukraine will look like whether it will be something where they will want to be coming back because the demographic problem, the problem of returning of human capital will be the biggest problem after the war. 
then there are our foreign partners who finance almost all of the economy of Ukraine because we cannot do it by ourselves, we cannot wage this war by ourselves and they will finance Ukrainian recovery and obviously they want to understand what recovery they will finance, what Ukraine they will finance after the war and for the window of opportunities will be as usually quite short. We should be ready for this. We were not ready in 1991 when Ukraine has gained independence. We were not ready after the revolution of dignity. And now we want to be ready for those changes. All of that has grown, not suddenly. It has grown from other projects back in May and June last year, more than 30 analytical centers in Ukraine joined their efforts in development of the vision of the post-war country, which was called Ukraine after the victory. The document was introduced in the conference in Lugano, and it covers a broad range of humanitarian, social, economical, security, and institutional issues. Back then, in May, almost all of the leading business associations of Ukraine, including the Union of Ukrainian Entrepreneurs, Chamber of Trade and Commerce, and others, have signed a memorandum of the creation of coalition of business unions for modernization of Ukraine, where they describe the fundamentals of the economic policy, the way the entrepreneurs, the businesses see it, and finally, before the conference in Lugano last year, more than 250 and today almost 500 civil organizations from all over Ukraine signed the Lugano Declaration, so-called Lugano Declaration, the manifest of the civil society, which described the key features, key factors of the recovery of, of post-war Ukraine and the red lines that cannot be crossed. This work was in fact continued in autumn when a number of parallel projects emerged related to development on institutional, so institutional, social and humanitarian policies to finalize that work logically, not only the vision but the strategy, the specific concepts of the specific draft laws and other regulations to be adopted so in fact is the continuation continuation of the work which was on since may last year and it covers dozens of uh, think tanks all across ukraine and i would say thousands of civil organizations all across ukraine that are also part of our system because we have to remember the project of who on the civil society which talks about all those policies with the civil organizations in Ukraine and holds the forums of the civil society. So it has grown from the last year initiatives when we've realized that we have to prepare for the recovery way beforehand. And secondly, it's only one of the branches of the huge project which aims at us having a detailed projects of the public policies in all spheres of Ukrainian life at the moment of victory. So we're ready for that chance when our international partners help us to start the recovery. Today we're introducing the first part of this document, which is called the analytical report. We analyze there what are the key factors of the development of Ukraine, of Ukrainian economy in different areas, what are the key decisions that were approved after the revolution of dignity, what were the challenges set by the war and how the Ukrainian government re reacted to those challenges, what was and was not done, what were the alternative solutions proposed by the civil organizations, businesses and international partners, what is its condition now and what are the restrictions set by the international agreement signed by Ukraine. In fact, this document is about the past and the present. Today we present it as the first part and in September we will present the second part about the future, specifically the strategy of the key reforms. I think that the word reform is a little bit maybe obsolete, 
and redundant uh, the concepts of the regulations to be adopted to make those things happen. So this is the concept of our work. I try to demonstrate a broad field. I may have confused our spectators, but I wanted to emphasize that it's a big story that has started long ago. It's one of the branches, branches and us in the Union of, Europe, of Ukrainian Entrepreneurs, we, take, we deal with the economic policy. Meanwhile, our friends in other collectives deal with social, humanitarian and other policies. I want to ask Mr. Andri, based on your expertise, what is the business condition in Ukraine and what are the prospects of the post-war recovery for Ukrainian businesses? In short, if we do nothing, the prospects are quite negative. I would like to put the presentation on the screen. The situation looks just like this. Ukraine, by its rating of economic freedoms, is in negative positions. We are not free country. Well, position 130 in this rating indicates that we are a country not interesting for allocation of talents, not attractive for investments, and not for doing business in general. Talking about the foreign investors, what are the factors that we satisfy for them? Whether we have financial resources for them, do we have a developed infrastructure? Is there government assistance for investments? Do we have enough qualified workforce? Are there government policies aimed at support of the investors? Are, is there an internal demand? There is a negative answer to all of these questions, unfortunately. Meanwhile, before the war, we said that we have quite a qualified and cheap workforce. However, now it's washed out. So talking about now, about the challenges we've received during the war, we have a negative activity of the businesses. UBI, Ukrainian Business Index, at position 35, which w is way below 50, and business develops, invests, and creates new jobs, only given this indicator is above 50. Also, these dynamics is evidenced by the forecasts of the business this year. That So if Back in November last year, the business expected the growth of 17%. Now business expects, expects most, almost 1% loss. What are the key problems that business sees? Aside of the lack of predictability is the absence of the, of the clients in uh, sufficient amount. We also uh, see the in unpredictability of the actions of the government from the point of view of the businesses is the third biggest challenge that creates the impossibility of investing and pushes the businesses outside Ukraine, the absence of capital adequacy and the access to cheap money and the obstacles created by fiscal bodies and two-thirds here, two-thirds of the entrepreneurs within the last year were, were experiencing pressure by different government authorities, the most of them in tax system, but also in permit system we see certain problems and obstacles exercised by the government authorities. So, from the point of view of the businesses, what should become the priorities of the government policy in terms of business cl climate? Obviously, it's overcoming of corruption, the court reforms, the rule of law is the basis. But what else? The creation of the business conditions, favorable business conditions. Why foreign or internal investors should invest in Ukraine and not in Poland, Bulgaria, Lithuania, or Tanzania, Uganda, Romania, other countries all across the world? The countries where the conditions are being created, where the investments are coming back, where there is a growing internal demand, and the tax burden is way below than in Ukraine.
So the key idea we're discussing now in business crowds and think tanks and what we try to accumulate in the Union of Ukrainian Entrepreneurs, what we try to integrate into government policies is the rule of law and expansion of economic freedom. So those are the key fundamental issues to be laid as fundamental of those policies. Now we're talking about the work of the experts and think tanks, but we also mention as that vision and those economic policies that were developed by coalition of Ukrainian business unions and the Union of European, oh sorry, Ukrainian entrepreneurs is one of the key players there. So we need to create Ukraine as the best place for raising investments, the best place for economic opportunities. And it requires from our basic principles of economic policy. So, uh, le decrease of participation of government in economy below 35%, liberalization of conditions for development of entrepreneurship, the independence of private property, independence of those government bodies such as anti-monopoly committee, and now we have to talk about other regulators as well, liquidation of infrastructure mon monopolies and development of human potential. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Andri. Mr. Hlip, the question to you. How do you assess the monetary policy of the government for the time being and what should be the strate strategic priorities of the state after the war? So let's start with the budget policy because funding and capability of funding of budget and financing of war is the key factor for the victory in ex ex key factor in exhaustion war that Russian aggression has transformed into. So if we check what was happening before the full-scale invasion since 2014, we've observed a number of positive tendencies. We've seen the redistribution of GDP through public finance, more than 50 percent from 50% of GDP in 2010 to 45%, 44% in 2014. And the decrease of oh, the, the budget decentralization when the communities got more, substantially more resources for implementation of their own policies. But after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the huge expenditure on defense became the reality specifically f for wages of the military which reached almost 100 billion hryvnias per year that was the one of the first steps as to the reaction to the new situation by the government policies implementation of tax stimuli and exemptions within the first month of the full scale invasion temporary exemptions for the imports that were that were established due to the lack of the products in the internal markets and the standstill for the external and internal debt also the reality was the increase of the funding by our allies but due to the delays in uh, in creation of the mechanisms of such funding last year, we had to resort to printing money in the amount of 400 million hryvnias, which resulted in their need for devaluation and speeding up of inflation. This year, the situation was looking like that. The state budget in the amount of, of more than three trillion hryvnia. The forecasted income was 1.4 trillion that was supposed to be spent on defense. The deficit was about to be covered by funding of the partners, which are expected in the amount of about 43 billion dollars compared to the 32 last year. Two-thirds of the ex budget expenses 
were aimed at defense and security. And in accordance with this picture restricted by the external factors, what's going on further is the return to the pre-war system of taxation. It was in part done from the 1st July by taxation of the fuel from the 1st of August we will return to the system of taxation for the beginning of the year 22 I'm talking about the joint tax, the ex inspections of the businesses and also within the next year the negotiations of about postponement on the payments on the external debt should be resumed as it was contemplated by the program with the IMF and the development of the strategy of the government income government proceeds. As to the monetary policy, there were a lot of victories starting from the year 2014 until year 21. I'm talking about the rejection of the fixed exchange rate, the adoption of the law on the currency and currency liberalization. What was more also important, another important factor that allowed the functioning of the banking system without crisis was the clearing of the banking system from the shell banks and banks that were laundering the money. It contemplated the disclosure of the structure of owners and the stress testing and the law on the splits which increased the control of the non-banking financial institutions such as insurance and payment systems institutions and the national bank has undertaken the regulating of those sectors the reaction of the national bank was quite profound they, they implemented the currency limitations But unfortunately, the National Bank, as I explained in the first part, was forced to bail out within year 21-22 the bonds in amount 250 million hryvnias. Another two steps were taken in summer, the tax hike from 10 to 12 percent. I mean, I'm sorry, interest rate hike and the change of the exchange rate up to 36 hryvnias per dollar. The inflation started slowing down and this year it will be at the level of 20, of below 15%. If I'm not mistaken, we see a rapid breaking of the inflation. We have a record amount of currency reserves, the operations in the exchange market, we see the resilience of the bank, but at the same time we see the restriction of the resources, as Mr. Andre mentioned, the obstacles for the businesses, for the funding, for the funding of economy, and, and simultaneous growth of the hryvnia deposits in the hryvnia accounts through the influx of the funds of the wages from the wages of the military in the banking system the national bank through their policy of reserves regulates the situation through the change of the rates over the deposit certificates however if we think that was going on further we have to ponder over the decrease of the interest rate. The last meeting of the National Bank already demonstrated that there is a number of the Monetary Committee of the National Bank that it's a timely measure and the lifting of the currency restrictions it should be balanced with the decrease of the interest rate. The higher the interest rate the better we can afford different currency restrictions which have their 
which have their negative consequences for the economy, their negative influence. So we have to preserve the fixed rate at least this year and the long awaited nationalization of the Saints Bank which belongs to which belongs to the sanctioned stakeholders but the nationalization is not yet exercised meanwhile the meanwhile the law is already signed by the president so we keep observing the situation here thank you very much miss elena i need to ask you yesterday the conference on recovery of ukraine in london was over and a lot of attention was paid to the issues of the green energy green industry what is the place of this topic in your research thank you very much i will probably start as my other colleagues what are the changes after the revolution of dignity and what has changed after the beginning of the full-scale invasion when we were discussing it inside the project we created we created such a notion as a lost drive because in the energy sector the reforms could be characterized by a certain drive you may remember the laws were written the secretary the energy community was working quite actively in ukraine everybody was trying to implement the maximum number of reforms in the sector of energy together with our energy companies whether with or without leadership but there was drive and thus we were able to in fact in fact the reforms in the energy sector were considered um, one of the best among the euro integration projects and reforms you can see it in the assessment of the european commission at least as of february this year we adopted the basic legislative package which included basic european laws in the sector of energy and we even had attempts to implement the fully liberalized markets in the sphere of gas supply if you remember in year 2020 it was over within a couple of months but at least we tried to reform the liberal to launch the liberalization liberalization in energy markets in full year. obviously after the beginning of the full-scale invasion energy is the sector that all of the country depends on so we had to switch to manual control i don't want to talk a lot about the bad but i'll try to draw a picture of something good and something bad that has happened after the beginning of the full-scale invasion but the destroyed infrastructure more than 50 percent of the energy infrastructure are destroyed in ukraine we have to discuss it honestly what will be the condition that we enter this winter whether we will have enough generation to go through this winter to pass through the heating season but again more than 50 percent one billion dollar is necessary for the emergency recovery and i think that more than 10 billion maybe 12 plus are required after the detonation of Kachovka Dam are so 12 million are required for the full recovery of the power infrastructure on the other hand after the beginning of the full-scale invasion Ukraine synchronized itself with the European energy structure we were dreaming about it for a long time after the year 2014 we were in long negotiations with European counterparts but in f we were not promised to get it soon but the full-scale invasion became the factor that sped up our euro integration it has happened we've demonstrated that our energy infrastructure is stable we don't unsynchronize anybody in fact we started exporting electric power when we were able to do it from june until october another big issue is the financial condition in energy markets it's bad in fact in short it's bad just like everybody just like everywhere i'm sorry there are no no funds for payment by the population and there are no funds in the generation so all the prices are subsidized it's no secret to anybody where to look for money how to find it is the question to the international financial institutions but to us as well to the correct policy of uh, protection of consumers those who can't afford pain so 
the government should develop the policy of monetization of subsidies, subsidies for consumers of gas and electric power. We have to launch it and we will need to liberalize the market. We will need to raise the prices, maybe not in emergency mode, but gr gradually within the next years we will have to do it. On the other hand, a plus, I don't know whether it is a plus, but we have a good support we are being helped with the equipment by our partners you may know about the ukrainian far ukrainian energy support fund that exists with the support of a lot of donors but its base is the energy community and through that fund ukraine ukrainian energy companies receive a lot of equipment transformers generators motors equipment you name it we received it during this winter and we will continue receiving it to r resume the normal operation of the system and to protect it against physical damage it in no way replaces the work we need to have done in terms of recovery but our international partners help us cover our emergency needs another important issue is the openness as the full-scale invasion erupted in energy infrastructure all information was closed and at the same time a lot of statistic information was closed our team analyzed all the data sites in energy sector that used to be open there is a couple hundreds of them and we've analyzed to what ex extent those data sets influence the energy security and part of them are obviously very important and should be closed but about 90 percent can be opened maybe not in details in aggregated way but both society and business need to know what is going on in the sector of energy or at least how we are preparing to the winter because for the time being it's very difficult to discuss it objectively without basing on the facts so we have this problem for the time being and it's supposed to be solved i mean the problem with accessibility to the figures to the statistics so everybody understands what's going on in the country including in the energy sector on the other hand i have to give its due that in terms of adoption of the euro integration laws there is a progress in energy sector a remit law was adopted recently a law that requires our regulator to correctly gather data to spread the data and to share the data with the European partners so everybody understands the state of affairs in the sector of gas and electric power which would allow us to raise foreign investments to our energy sector. As to the future, we are about to discuss a future scenarios but I need to say that there are three rules that should work everywhere and first of all in the energy sector first is the openness the accessibility of the data, accessibility of information. Without that, we won't be able to understand how to sort things out in any sector. Then it's efficiency. In our case, is the energy efficiency, is the support of the businesses, support of the consumers, everybody in implementation of the technologies that will consume less energy. Ukraine has incredible opportunities to reduce consumption of the energy and to continue evolving economically and it should be one of the fundamentals of our successful development and the third thing that was mentioned today is the rule of law the same rules for everybody in our specific case it means that every government authority should do what they're supposed to do and there should be no interference of their policy i'm talking about ministries parliament regulators and in the energy is especially important thank you very much thank you miss olena mr eager i need to ask you a question everybody understands that ukrainian infrastructure and environment are in horrible condition what is your assessment of the of those things and their prospects 
in the post-war development, I will try to start with the infrastructure and then proceed to the environment. Those sectors are interrelated as everything in economy, but they have their specifics. So let's start from the beginning. In, when Ukraine got its independence, a, a number of laws were adopted that are in effect until now, and they define the areas of development of infrastructure. So in infrastructure, we have the laws adopted back in 90s, early 2000s, and within the last years b before the war, after the revolution of dignity, that project intensified. The government of Ukraine implemented a number of prog programs related to the development of railway transport. There are still two draft laws in uh, the parliament which are related to the development of railway. There are programs adopted for the development of airports and programs related to the development of maritime transport and many other documents. And it's obvious that one of our biggest achievements of pre-war achievements w was the joining to the agreement of the open skies. So thus we integrate in the European Union technically. After the war, the priorities of development and, and the areas of activity of infrastructure has changed significantly. The first thing was the evacuation of the Ukrainian population and relocation of the businesses. Then the ensuring of the uninterrupted supplies of weapons of Ukraine. We've lost one sector. I mean, the air transportation, the skies are closed above Ukraine. This is why we lose a part of the currency proceeds that we were receiving from that sector. And obviously, there are huge problems with the maritime transport. The maritime transport does not operate normally today. The only thing we can talk about are the corridors of solidarity, the export of Ukrainian grain. But we clearly understand that it's an artificial system and it depends a lot on the military situation and the policies of aggressor the policies of aggressor unfortunately at the same time ukrainian infrastructure was affected just like energy infrastructure was affected by bombardments by the warfare we have more than three billion of losses in this area and the infrastructure was recovered at the expense of the infrastructure itself i mean the businesses the companies that work there they've undertaken those losses and now we have a simple question, just like in energy, what is the level of resilience of those businesses and the resilience of that internal system? Regarding the prospects of development, I think that, first of all, we have to talk about the resilience of Ukrainian infrastructure before we start talking about some global things. We have to provide for the survival of Ukrainian economy, the operation of infrastructure with all the relevant consequences. The other thing is the strategy. If we talk about the strategy, we need money. I won't stop even at that, but obviously we need the new tools for its development. It's first of all the insurance of military risks for those who will invest in Ukrainian infrastructure. And it's a number of issues related to our, so to say, strategic vision, how we are about to develop the infrastructure in view of the future development of infrastructure. The, the roads are not necessary f uh, uh, just for the sake of themselves. They need to provide for some logistic chains, logistic links. And another thing is the search for some new tools. I'm talking about the government and private partnership. There was a number of documents adopted Back in their day, we have more than 100 agreements entered into now a huge number of agreements, actually, that are related to the government-private partnership. 19 of them are operating, but 13 of them were suspended due to the military operations. So this is why we're getting back to the tool, which is increasingly important without which we, it would be difficult for us to raise investments and anything related to the intellect in the development of smart infrastructure. And the second part
is the problems with the environment. The policies of environmental protection are as such. On one hand, we had traditional problems with the environmental protection. Ukraine did not demonstrate, unfortunately, some serious efforts in this area, and that's a problem. And obviously, the war-related issue, they had the imprint of what we have today. I'm not even talking about the Kahovka Dam. We can talk about mining, we can talk about poisoning of a lot of uh, lands related to the fires in our oil processing capacities. The, the shellings are also resulting in, in contamination of environment, but the environmental policy is the is considered one of the most costly policies in European Union and the problem is that we don't need to only talk about strategic things but also to clearly understand that the recovery of the environment is something that is supposed to be the longest term policy in view of all the issues because it's not about only our desire but also the objective laws of nature that we cannot cancel the environmental policy is the cross-sectoral policy we understand that all the sectors should be built into the overall logic of those processes and also let's not forget that in ukraine the changes are going on we also feel the climatic changes Ukrainian agriculture is changing. I'm talking about certain agricultural technologies. I'm no specialist there, but I have to say that some technologies are being changed. The set of source is being reviewed due to the changes going on in Ukraine, going on in the environment. And it's clear that all those things should be should be taken into account as well. The last thing I want to mention is that there are not only obvious problems emerging due to the war, but as you know, there will be a lot of discussions related to such things as Kahovka Dam, for example. There is a point of view that it should be reconstructed and then we will move on. But now there is a number of people who say, let's see, maybe this recovery is not as important and necessary in terms of environment. So there is a lot of things where there is no single point of view and it creates additional problem. I would like to wrap up with the fact that the infrastructure and the environment are things that depend on the overall condition of Ukrainian economy, on the vector of its development, of our international cooperation and many things there will be set from outside within the limits of our obligations in front of the European Union. So let's remember the last meeting of the G7 leaders in Hiroshima and the issue of environmental protection there. So whether we want it or not, but development of those sectors will be happening within the global economic and political processes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valeri. You have a small remark. Yeah, after we've listened to all the speakers, to all the panelists, who provided a lot of details, I would like to emphasize a number of key things. The war is always a ruination of economy, but it's always a chance of the high quality economic leap, a chance that can be used and that can be failed as well. Our task is not to fail it. We have we have the support of our international partners for that. We have a huge number of citizens inside the country who aspire to changes, who want to live in the wealthy country. We have a, an expert community who knows what to do. And the only thing left is to have it done. And some of the things need to be done today. I would like to emphasize that the recovery of Ukraine is the biggest and most complicated project in the world within the last maybe 70 years. There was no precedent, any precedent like this. It creates additional chances, chances, risks, and our tasks was in gathering a number of prominent experts, economists, specialists in the sectors of economy, in, uh, sorry, energy, infrastructure, finance, and so on. 
to develop the key strategies of the changes in the country after the victory and together a number of civil organizations and communities to address those changes well not of the changes will be made in the national level there is a lot of things to be changed in the level of communities this is why we need understanding in these communities how to do one thing or another that was our goal so today we present the first part of the document which is the analytic report about the past and the present and in september again we will present the second part which is our vision of the future the document is available we invite everybody to discussion because obviously after the remarks it will be amended we are ready for that and we invite everybody to the dialogue we invite the representatives of ukrainian government of the parliament we are in permanent dialogue with some of them we have the unity of vision in what is needed to be done we just need enough political will to have it done after the victory thank you <laughs> dear colleagues do we have any questions to the speakers good uh, morning yana koloda ukraine forum my question is as follows as it was mentioned russia inflicted significant losses on ukraine so now ukraine with the help of international donors covers the infrastructure recovery issues so how to get the international community interested in getting more involved in such support how ukraine can interest the foreign investors to invest in ukraine thank you well regardless of the fact that there is a huge amount of excessive money in the world uh, it's counted in trillions of hryvnias but ukrainian economy is way underrated but that money was not flowing into ukraine even before the war but the efficiency of the use of resources in ukraine you know ukraine could become a next big thing another big opportunity for the world and europe but it's not happening due to a number of key conditions first is the absence of the rule of law if it it's not existent the investors well i'm not even talking about the pension funds who would invest in ukraine for 20 or 30 years ahead but there will be no venture investors either another thing is the low level of the existing complexity of economy we are a raw materials economy why would you invest in the raw materials economy if we don't increase the level of complexity if we don't make it an element of the for government policy we will have no investments either and uh, like co big companies will choose poland and romania and other countries another thing is profitability uh, it's counted in different factors like the cost of money is clear that it's not about to happen in ukraine shortly but what ukraine could offer is to create the better conditions for doing business through tax reforms through insurance of investments through customs reforms those reforms that would make business profitable in ukraine everything all the countries around ukraine implemented those laws the the law on the capital uh, expert for example and the fourth condition we have to work on to have the investments raised here is the qualification of personnel qualification of the people working in ukraine unfortunately apart from the population that was already mentioned there is a process of degrading of the workforce it specialists inventors they all prefer working abroad and they relocate from ukraine at their first opportunity ukraine has to become a magnet for the qualified specialists and all that said we may count on the foreign investments just a short 
comment what Mr. Andre has mentioned in my understanding it's about the projects that are added to what was destroyed by Russia and regarding those losses inflicted by Russia uh, in my opinion Russia should pay for that and we have more than 300 billion dollars of the Russian central bank assets that can be channeled for the recovery of those facilities that belong to private owners but due to the fright that can be justified in with no moral factors the confiscation of those assets they are still in the depositors of first of all of European Union and I want to add to something Mr. Glib just said it will be probably a new statement but I think it's important to have it discussed both in Ukraine and outside is the statement that apart from the frozen existing Russian monies abroad we need to have a mechanism developed of the additional foreign tax the elements of the regular payments from the Russians who live in Russia or the trade operations that Russia will be conducting within the decades to come and the task will be not only to cover the expenses but to make sure every Russian remembers that in case of th they do any damage to any country they will pay and their children will pay so this work should s start now upon the initiative of Ukraine thank you we have another question uh, Oleg Bochun the vice president of the Academy of Energy of Ukraine. I support Ms. Val Mr. Valery Pecker, but I have a question to Ms. Olena. Are Ukrainerka and other government officials, they think that all the energy should be should be invested in concrete, so to say, but as we say, we should have the unions of green energy from the below what do you think where those funds will be channeled to they will be invested in concrete i think and i have a question to mr igor barakovsky transparency in, in international had a research called why are ukrainians afraid of recovery and 70 percent said that it's corruption we have this word recovery we continue saying recovery so why are government officials continue talking about Infrastructure, uh, sorry, reconstruction and where is the corruption component here? To answer this question, we need to understand what what our government says. This strategy is closed now. What are the plans of Ukraine Energy and the Ministry of Recovery? What should be done next? Because we are around. Uh, we are about to discuss some conditional scenarios. It's not very efficient. I can say that we need to think how to protect our generation this winter and what to protect it with physically, whether we will have in sufficient air defense capabilities to put near every, say, thermal power plant. I don't know whether we will be supplied a sufficient amount of air defense capabilities if not there there should be another solution what the physical protection of every thermal power plant looks like what the physical protection of every trans transformer looks like I have no solutions for this but it, I think it should be subject to discussion already now and we are supposed to be informed that there is some solution and some work underway as to the creation of that high level of the operation of in, uh, energy infrastructure including decentralized infrastructure energy infrastructure obviously it is a priority if I have understood you correctly we've heard it from the government the only thing we have not heard is that decentralized uh, energy infrastructure what it looks like in the regional level well starting from the r regional energy regulator and distribution company if somebody wants to install some small generation 
capacities, how it should be connected, how this cooperative should be created. We have a small number of them in the country, so this work is not done enough. Us as a Dixie, we will try to implement some small projects to test and so we can answer this question for ourselves what is decentralized energy infrastructure but i think that the ministry and the government should at least start the public discussion with all the stakeholders including the communities and with the cities about what this decentralization looks like this decentralized energy infrastructure b because the business will start coming and asking what what it looks like what are the rules what are we supposed to pay to what service for example to get connected to the to our power grid so it's a huge task thank you thank you very much just in short i will either summarize or continue what Mr. Andre said when we talk about raising of foreign investments the key idea the conceptual idea is the trust and transparency if there is no trust and transparency the other things just don't work what Andre said the elements of the transparency are the elements of trust so during the London conference there was the dream system presented is the idea for demonstration of all, to all the interested parties what should be entering what should be exiting what are the incoming funds how they are spent for example if not in real time at least on the projects if we can check it there is a relevant website this uh, system is being launched and another element I'm, I'm not going to be talking about corruption it's not my specialty but it would be good for us to have a small discussion about the for example corruption lessons of the big construction we need to discuss those topics there are many topics to consider they are not to execute or put somebody in prison but the lessons we should learn there are relevant uh, documents that we have to re review we have to learn on our mistakes and eradicate them and when we talk about building reconstruction and recovery it's not a matter of terms the key matter is about the recovery of economy but at the same time we need to understand whether it is recovery or renewal or or like they say build back better we need to build back on a level of a higher quality not in bigger amount I would like to finalize it with the two statements first of all about the recovery of the processes this project is also a part of something that can guarantee the participation of the representatives of the broad number of civil organizations and business associations in this process they can become the guarantor of the transparency of those processes us as an institution as the unity of Ukrainian entrepreneurs we can be a reliable partner for our international organizations and donors on one hand and on the other hand we can represent the interests of the business and on the third part we can we can represent the interests of the government so it should be a triangle which provides for the transparency of those processes and also to wrap up i would like to add that we continue this work as Mr. Valeri said is the first step and today the status of this project for the time being but we have a, a press conference ahead of us in September but before that we are about to present our vision of the specialists from different regions we will have regional meetings and I invite active communities the regions where we'll be coming with the discussion to get involved in those discussions to add their visions so that together we may work out the document which will help us recover and talking about the foreign investors let's remember that there is Ukrainian business who invests in Ukraine now and those are capital investments even regardless of the word this is something that we have to keep in mind too I want to thank our panelists we will be waiting for you in September with the final presentation I hope in these walls and I hope that thanks to your expertise the recovery of Ukraine will 
gain some momentum and will be efficient and Ukraine Media Center, Ukraine Forum will continue its operation today. Keep, stay tuned.